So hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining this joint webinar between the Nuclear Institute's YGN, Friends of Nuclear Energy and the YEP as part of our COP26 series. The topics that our speakers will present on all surround the theme net zero and how nuclear renewables and new technologies can work together. Just to note that this webinar is being recorded for this evening and will be available to watch afterwards. The event will consist of three presentations from our wonderful speakers. We're very happy to be joined by Jonathan Reynolds, Managing Director of Opergy, Julia Pike, Director of Financing and Economic Regulation at Sizewell C, and Guy Newey, Director of Strategy and Performance at Energy Systems Catapult. We welcome you in the audience to submit any questions in the Q&A box throughout the event, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the dedicated Q&A section after the presentations. So without further ado, let's hand over to Jonathan Reynolds to talk about how nuclear and renewables can work together to achieve net zero. Thanks very much, Lady. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm Jonathan Reynolds, I'm Managing Director of OPG. We're a consulting company that works across the energy space, across nuclear, offshore wind, other renewables, uh, and very much uh, engaged in the hydrogen economy right now, very early stages of developing hydrogen technologies and also looking at integrated energy hubs, but we'll skip over the advert. So next slide, please. Um, so nuclear renewables, net zero, and working together and bringing a bit of balance. So for me, I'm gonna offer a few, few insights from certainly my perspective, but I think the first thing is to recognize energy is fundamental to everything we do these days. Whether it's heating and lighting our homes or powering our businesses, transporting people and goods, and you can, you can read that good quote there on the right. But, Quite often for us now, in my view, it's a lack of understanding and lack of appreciation. There is this historic dependence on sort of fossil fuel technologies that's largely led to the current climate crisis. I think that's, that's recognised by, by most uh, certainly climate, climate scientists and those in this space. But renewable energy in particular now plays a significant and a growing role in both the UK and the global mix. But as many of you will know on the call, that the wind unfortunately doesn't blow at the right speed 24 hours a day and sun certainly doesn't shine uh, all day long unfortunately we're today it's, it's rather nice uh, so storage is absolutely essential and much more energy and, and battery storage on the grid to try to balance some of the intermittency is going to be absolutely key but the role of nuclear is absolutely vital but not only is that continuous flexible power output but also a source of heat and low carbon heat for future low carbon production i know judy will touch on that uh, shortly both must work in partnership, both need to work in partnership if we're going to really stimulate the net zero related opportunities, certainly around storage, hydrogen, and, and, and really other novel technologies uh, on the road to net zero. Next slide, please. But what do we actually mean? There's, there's, there's a lot of people who've got different definitions of net zero or clean growth and, and related back to climate change, but at, at its simplest, certainly for, for us, it's the, you know, the goal to effectively cut greenhouse gas emissions to nil. I focus very much on greenhouse gas emissions there, not just carbon emissions. Certainly from the energy sectors, you know, we deal a lot in other greenhouse gases, whether it's in methane or sulfur hexafluoride or, or other greenhouse gases that are actually more damaging to, to the environment than carbon. So having this, this wider you know, discussion around net zero across greenhouse gases and, and reducing that to nil uh, is really important. Um, next slide, please. It's important to note net zero is not solely a responsibility or you know, an action for the energy sectors or, you know, or any particular industrial sectors. It's going to act in something that every single person, homeowner, business, you know, society in general will have to address, including the energy sectors. But in terms of the road to decarbonisation, the, the energy sector will actually have a, a huge role to play. If we look at renewables growth for, for a moment, so over the last uh, you know, few years, re total renewable capacity has increased by over 500%. You can see the, you know, the graph there in terms of the rapid growth in bioenergy, huge growth in, in onshore and offshore wind, but also in solar more recently over the last five or six years. So it's a significant growth across all those various vectors. But more importantly, certainly over the last 18 months, renewables and other low carbon technologies have been seen as much more resilient during the coronavirus pandemic than many other sectors. And so that's, that's something we are really looking at this whole build back better, kind of, uh, delivering net zero through you know, a new kind of economic growth narrative. So this whole build back better, plan for growth, 
uh, and you'll probably be uh, you're turning over to the, the news later on and feel that better will probably be a phrase uh, that you're certainly coming out of the G7 today uh, down in Cornwall uh, is, is, is very topical. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to very quickly skirt over some of the, the, the big sectors. So solar, solar photovoltaics is growing and it's growing at a rapid pace. Costs have been coming down dramatically. Over a million uh, solar installations across the whole uh, across the UK, generating around about 13 gigawatts of power already. And just in, in the UK, we're looking at about three billion pounds to you know, forecast in another, another three and a half gigawatts of new solar projects. These are the larger solar projects. I'm not talking about individual solar panels or roofs or homes or businesses. This is the big five megawatt plus uh, yeah, kind of solar arrays. And the graphic there is the former RAF culture shield in Norfolk, uh, which is now a large 50 megawatts. Uh, you, know, you can see there a solar farm with battery storage being considered at the moment. And there's uh, two actually hydrogen companies on that business park uh, to the right uh, of the site, looking at hydrogen light aircraft. Uh, through hydrogen fuel cells. So some interesting novel technologies related to solar. Um, next slide, please. Battery storage, again, is, is a, is, is, we're seeing huge, huge growth in battery storage technologies and projects. Uh, and if you look at these with the renewable energy planning databases and, and, and other similar databases, you'll see kind of a, a number of 49.9 megawatt systems or battery projects uh, looking to connect to the grid. Uh, so just below that 50 megawatt threshold for, for support and, and other incentives. But we're seeing about you know, at least six gigawatts uh, of you know, new battery storage projects with an estimated kind of investment forecast of around about nine billion by 2013. And the majority of those are already in the planning system or have already been approved and are waiting construction. But many of those are actually are going to be standalone battery storage projects on the grid, um, mostly on the distribution grid, not the transmission grid. But more and more we're seeing co-location. So co-location with battery storage and solar projects or wind projects. Certainly offshore wind is now looking at large battery storage projects, either you know, partly built into the turbines offshore, but also for sort of off offshore collector stations. This is probably one of the big growth areas in the related technologies that's not a generation technology. It's one of the yeah, probably fastest growing technology areas in this space, uh, but absolutely critical uh, on the road to net zero. Next slide, please. Just looking at onshore winds, uh, onshore wind has had a bit of a you know, challenging few years. It's very much back on the agenda, and the government's starting to look at uh, how we can really invest and support it in onshore wind. One of the most mature technologies we have, and certainly with the advances that we're seeing in offshore wind technology, where it's coming back onto, into, into onshore wind technology, is bringing all sorts of innovation to scale up generator technology and the size of the output. You can see there's some of the stats that uh, we've got about 13, just over nearly 14 gigawatts of, of onshore wind. So almost as much solar as we have onshore wind in the UK and just nearly uh, eight and a half thousand plus uh, turbines. Um, again, huge growth opportunities. And again, we're seeing co-location with onshore wind, solar, bioenergy uh, yeah, and battery storage projects uh, in some sites as well. Next slide, please. Oh, that's it, offshore wind. <clears throat> So offshore wind is arguably one of the larger um, renewable energy growth opportunities in the UK, if not globally. We have a target for 40 gigawatts of capacity in the UK by 2030. We're about 10 and a half right now in terms of the operating capacity and about 15 plus in planning and various stages of planning process. But offshore wind is also looking at you know, beyond generating electricity. So it's already looking at what can we do in terms of hydrogen generation powered by offshore wind. We look at large scale storage and large scale and opportunities, but it's also now looking to try and decarbonize its own supply chain. So the role of vessels, the role of aircraft, drones and other related technologies to actually decarbonize the whole of the value chain, and the whole of the supply chain for these projects. But uh, we're, we're seeing about uh, 60 billion plus forecast investment in UK offshore wind projects alone between now and, and out to sort of 2040. Uh, next slide, please. We've been posing the question for, for a few years, what if we didn't produce electricity? Certainly in an offshore wind or you know, onshore renewables context, what if we actually looked at clean water through seawater desalination? We have very, very uh, yeah, serious water stress issues in some parts of the UK, certainly in the east of England, where, where I'm currently based, and I know Julie will touch on in terms of the, the opportunities around size well, but we have you know, some real issues around clean water that we could help to solve through seawater desalination. 
Why are we talking about that? Because actually, if you're looking at all the forecasts in hydrogen technology, and certainly green hydrogen through electrolysis, or the raw material to make that happen is water. We're going to need a lot more water as a raw material for producing hydrogen and oxygen, uh, hopefully as, as the, the energy systems change. We've also got novel technologies about can we use that power to capture CO2? And I know Julie will touch on that as well. And there's lots of other opportunities that we can do if we start just thinking about our whole systems approach rather than individual projects. Next slide, please. I'm not going to labour too much on this. Uh, I know Julie's going to touch on it from uh, the Sizewell Clean Energy Hub. But it's, it's a concept that I would actually, you know, you know, I know Julie will go into a little bit of detail, I think, but I think this is one of the, the real gems uh, of uh, an energy hub concept where we can take heat and power and certainly electricity, certainly from a nuclear power station, or hopefully many more, but also look to overlay some of the renewables output. So balancing that continuous output from nuclear with the variability or intermittency uh, from renewables, whether wind or solar. And you can see some of that opportunity there, and I've, I've just kind of put desalination in there, but hydrogen, battery storage, data centers, and all of that flexible output, but uh, I'll let Julia talk a little bit more about that. So next slide, please. Now, hopefully a lot of you would have been uh, you know, talking about hydrogen, and uh, I know that uh, up speakers will be talking about hydrogen as well. Um, hydrogen is almost the, the one part of the energy scene that is kind of binding all of the energy technologies together now. So we've got lots of renewable and low carbon electricity, plan to power these you know, large-scale electrolyzers producing lots of lovely green uh, renewable low-carbon hydrogen uh, for a whole variety of uses. And you can see on the right-hand side there, power buildings, transport industry, all of those various options. <clears throat> and what's even more exciting around some of those areas is the innovation that we also need to invest in, in the technology itself that will drive and use that hydrogen. So all of that new innovation in vehicles, that new innovation in heating systems, in uh, in industry, industrial kind of processes as well. So huge opportunities for, for driving net zero, and it's the energy scene, and certainly renewables, nuclear, and other net zero technologies that are driving this. But next slide, please. Uh, so I think my last slide as well. So where next? I think nuclear renewables as partners, genuine partners are two of the key sectors, if not the major sectors, that we need to focus on as part of a post-COVID greener economic recovery. We now need to kind of really look at this much bigger whole systems approach around network architecture, network design, and how we can bring the developers together to help co-design some of those opportunities rather than this individual developer-led approach that we currently have with, with the planning system. We need to be looking at you know, scoping shared and collaborative infrastructure projects, so energy hubs that bring together different developers or different technologies, sometimes that you know, were not necessarily comfortable bedfellows a decade ago, actually now are very, very interesting kind of uh, collaboration opportunities. And certainly how we can join up skills development. That's a common denominator across all of these sectors is we need suitably qualified and experienced people. Uh, we need the supply chain businesses to hopefully scale up and realize some of the capacity constraints to help us deliver uh, you know, some of these exciting opportunities. But at the same time, let's really support the next generation through some of the STEM commitments around science, technology, engineering, and maths. Let's really focus and deliver against diversity commitments. Um, but let's make sure we have a collaborative, this multi-layered plan that delivers uh, net zero, hopefully way before uh, 2050. I'll stop there and we will pick up a little bit more later on in the Q&A. Thank you. Great, thanks for that, Jonathan. It was really interesting. Clearly the narrative surrounding nuclear and renewables needs to be one of collaboration rather than one seeing the other as the competitor. So with that in mind, and I know you touched on it a little bit, but what would you say is the best way to get the two industries working in harmony? Oh, that's a really big question. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm always gonna lean on Julia a little bit perhaps to answer that in the moment when she comes on the screen because the EDF is, is a fantastic example of how a multiple technologies can work together within one kind of you know, corporate environment. So, investing in nuclear, in you know, renewables, in solar. We have a number of new solar projects in uh, not too far away from where I'm living, developed by EDF Renewables. So I think there are good examples of practice and the collaboration already happening. We need to shine a more of a light on that, but actually how we can integrate the technologies through the critical infrastructure of the grid and energy hub projects, I think will start to drive those collaborative discussions far, far quicker. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks very much, Jonathan. We're now going to hand over to our second presenter of the evening, Julia Pike, who will talk about how nuclear can support net zero across all aspects of the economy. 
Thanks, Amy. Um, so, I, first of all, I'd really like to thank Friends of Nuclear Energy for organising this. I think it's really important that we all focus on what energy technologies and other businesses can do together. And, um, and we sort of increasingly move away from what has been quite a competitive approach to um, which technology is better than the next technology. The answer is we need the right mix of technologies to achieve net zero while bringing costs down for consumers and making sure that as many people as possible can benefit from the energy transition. So that's, that's my main theme of this evening, which is how can we work together looking at the system as a whole, the energy system, but also businesses who are supplied by the energy system. And I know that that's something which Guy has been a thought leader on at a national level. So I'm very much looking forward to his talk. And it's really good to follow on from Jonathan, who's been really active in working to practically join up thinking on a regional basis. So as this slide says, we want to develop Sizewell C to be the servant of the system, helping to decarbonize industry, transport and heating. What do we mean by that? What we mean is that although nuclear can provide base load power, so, so it can produce um, the same amount of power all the time, whatever the weather, what we want to do is to fit size well within an increasingly intermittent system. So people have historically focused quite a lot on can you make the nuclear reaction flexible? The answer to which is yes, you can. In France, the nuclear reactors do something which is called load following, i.e. they follow how much power the system wants from time to time, which as um, the proportion of renewables in France increases um, is something which they've done more of. And the working um, EPR in China and Taishan has also demonstrated a lot of physical flexibility. But that, that's, only, that's only one aspect of it. What, what we should really look at is given the amount of electricity that the UK is going to need over the next decades, as we increasingly look at electrifying transport, heating, et cetera, and of course, lots and lots of things become data-driven. We need to look properly at what can we use electricity for when we don't need it on the grid. And that, that's of course, not just nuclear electricity, it's all electricity. And as Jonathan said, some of the uses of electricity when it's not needed for, for the national grid are for hydrogen. So they are for desalination, particularly in um, very, very dry areas like the east of England, um, for powering data centers con continuously. And then the second way that we can look at the flexibility of nuclear power stations is to look at how much heat we can extract from the nuclear rea reactor before it um, reaches the turbines. So in the UK, nuclear reactors have never um, taken out the heat before the heat has, has reached the turbines to make the electricity. And that's really just because um, the UK hasn't really valued heat sufficiently highly. We've, you know, it, it's not that cold a country and we have burnt a lot of gas and coal. In other countries which are essentially colder and have therefore valued heat a lot more highly, it's actually very common to use the heat directly from nuclear power stations for district heating. So in, in some countries, so for example, in Russia, heat is pumped up to around 70, 80 kilometers from nuclear power stations to provide district heating. In China, a whole city is going to be heated by a nuclear power station. Um, I believe that in Sweden, a, a large proportion of Stockholm was heated by a nuclear power station um, in previous decades. So we're going to, in size well C, we're going to be able to take out heat. And you know, low carbon heat in, is going to be um, really something at a premium. It's not something which it's easy to create and we will have a lot of it. And so we've been looking at how can we use that heat to best effect and we can use that heat as I've come on to, to power direct air capture technologies we can use heat to make hydrogen electrolysis more efficient. And we're actually um, considering a study at the moment into a heat-based desalination technology. There are lots and lots of opportunities and it's a very exciting time to be looking at all of this. And of course, industry also needs a lot of clean heat and power 
and because there is a successful Freeport bid in the east of England, we'll be looking at opportunities to work with the Freeport to provide clean heat and power. So can we look at the next slide, please? So we would like to work with the renewables industry to drive a domestic hydrogen cluster in the east of England. At Sizewell, we actually have the electricity from a lot of offshore wind farms coming onto the same beach as Sizewell Sea. So you literally in the same small area have a very significant proportion of the UK's low carbon electricity. And so we must be able to work together and we have started talking to some renewables companies around jointly powering electrolyzers. Because if you want to make hydrogen from an electrolyzer, you want to make the most use you can of your electrolyzer because electrolyzer technology is expensive. So you want to run it 24 seven, so nuclear is great. You also want to take advantage of the times when there's an awful lot of wind and the wind energy is a lot cheaper. So wind has got also great advantages. And what's really good is if you get the two technologies to work together, powering the electrolyzer together, um, alongside solar, of course. So the, the reason we are um, bunching this as a domestic hydrogen cluster is in, in contrast to some of the industrial cluster ideas, which are being developed, particularly at the moment in the side, which are great. What we think we can do with a domestic cluster is that because of the power of Sizewell C and its size, and the fact that we will bring our own hydrogen demand to use clean H2 powered construction vehicles, buses, we hope in due course, lorries, diggers, we are able to actually marry up our supply of hydrogen, which we can make with electricity from Sizewell B, and we hope from the offshore wind, which is also in Suffolk, to, and we can marry up our, our supply of hydrogen to our self-generated demand. And we can work with other businesses in Suffolk, with the Freeport, with the councils, to aggregate the demand and to look collectively at how and where to install hydrogen refueling infrastructure. And we can get the whole thing going as a domestic cluster. And the domestic cluster will enable people to actually see the benefits of net zero in their lives. So industrial clusters are great. Domestic clusters, we would hope, would help people see that buses going through, for example, Ipswich, which had been powered by hydrogen, um, are going to reduce particulate emissions and increase the um, air quality for people. And some, some places like Suffolk, you're probably looking at more hydrogen use than in other places because battery buses and lorries uh, probably have a range which isn't suitable at the moment, certainly for rural areas. And because there are some sorts of heavy vehicles, which again are probably going to be hydrogen based in the future rather than battery based. And that's, that's, not, that's not to suggest that there's really competition between electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles. There is a huge need to decarbonize vehicles and there is a lot of room for both technologies to develop to best advantage. So as the slide says, Sizewell is actually a great place to be making hydrogen because we are within reach of the Bacton terminal. We are in reach of the ports at Felix, Felix and Harwich and also the ABP ports at um, Ipswich and Lowestoft and because of the presence of an awful lot of offshore wind and increasingly solar alongside the nuclear. So can we look at the next slide, please? So here's just a, a picture of, of how we hope that the Freeport can involve nuclear and offshore wind working together. You can see the wind turbines and the power station, both Sizewell B and Sizewell C, the construction and the idea that together we make um, electricity, which goes to make green hydrogen, which powers construction vehicles and in due course, other zero emissions vehicles and gets this cluster going that I was just talking about. Uh, we're also very interested in looking at clean maritime fuel and we're um, going to start working with, um, with universities on developing clean maritime fuel ideas. So can we look at the next slide, please? Now, to say a little bit about direct air capture, what is direct air capture? and Why is it important to this concept of working together? If you want to reach net zero, 
there are always going to be some things which are, it's very hard to take carbon out of. And so you need some technologies which are actually carbon negative, i.e. They, they take carbon out of the atmosphere. One of those technologies is direct air capture, which at a um, super simple non-technical level sucks air through filters, through a solvent and the solvent captures the CO2. The CO2 is either put into the network um, similar to CCUS networks, which will bury the carbon in old oil and gas wells, or it can be used for all the things which people actually need to use CO2 for. There are some agricultural uses, um, synthetic fuels, etc. And at the moment, direct air capture is very expensive because it's very electricity hungry. So we are working with Nottingham University and Strata to um, look at a technology which doesn't use electricity, it uses heat. And because it uses heat, and because we are going to have a lot of very cheap, low carbon heat at round about the right temperature, then this um, cheap low carbon heat can very significantly reduce the cost of direct air capture by a um, very significant factor, sort of down from round about at the moment 500 pounds a tonne to we hope something less than 80 pounds a tonne. And so we would very much hope that in due course, once this technology has been proven, we'll be able to make the sizeable sea plant actually carbon negative and help other technologies have a continued life while still achieving net zero. And can you go on to my next slide, please? So this is just something really about working together and, and the power of a big project. You know, big projects definitely bring disadvantages. There is a lot of um, disruption and noise and traffic, and we can't, we can't deny that those things are part of us building a nuclear power station on the Suffolk coast. But on the other hand, they bring some good things and they bring the power of a lot of thought and energy. And so we've been working with the community in Leyston, which is the town nearest to Sizewell, on a project to take Leyston to net zero. So it's an engineered route map. What does Leyston need to do in order to achieve a net zero position for its own emissions? So working with companies like Atkins, with Jonathan himself in Opogee, with the Energy Systems Catapult, from which Guy is a leader, Ikigai Capital with the council, with Leyston together with Carbon4, which is a French consultancy which has done a lot of work in, in looking at how to make La Rochelle in particular a net zero town. We've been um, developing an engineered route map. And one of the things which Kwasi Kwarteng says when he's giving talks is that we actually have as a nation, we have a lot of the technologies, if not all the technologies that we need to make the UK net zero. And what we don't have at the moment is enough social buy-in. So as well as, as well as, helping Leyston itself achieve net zero, we're hoping that this will provide an open source route map for other towns who are interested in achieving net zero, because it, it operates a bit like Dragon's Den in which we bring forward ideas and the community says whether or not those ideas are of interest. And we should, through this process, discover together what is it which is a socially acceptable way of achieving net zero and always always remembering that we need to make sure that net zero is affordable for all and um, therefore is going to get national buy-in. So I think that is my last slide and I've probably talked for long enough. Thanks, Julia. It always amazes me to see how many opportunities there are outside of just power generation at a nuclear power plant. So Sizewell C is currently in discussion with government, and I was wondering how has the development of the energy hub concept impacted the government's understanding and perception of nuclear and the role it sees in a future net zero system? I think the, the biggest change um, in terms of discussions with the government between Hinckley and Sizewell is that because Hinckley um, is a CFD project, it's it's highly incentivized to put all its electricity onto the national grid because that, that's what it gets paid for. And what we've been very keen to achieve with Sizewell with these extra uses, both of heat and non-grid uses of electricity in mind, is to make sure that Sizewell is economically flexible, i.e. it's paid to be available. And then the choice of the proportion of heat versus electricity that it makes 
and the uses of the electricity, whether it's for the grid or, or it's for hydrogen or for desalination, essentially become policy choices and they're not, they're not driven by the economics of the power station itself, they're driven by need. And that's why we're very much hoping it can be characterised as the servant of an increasingly intermittent system. Great, thank you very much, Julia. Um, so it's now time to hand over to our final presenter of the evening, Guy Newey, who will be talking about what role new technologies can play in reaching net zero. Thanks very much. Um, there's, there's always some really tedious uh, uh, kind of battles, arm wrestles, tussles in energy policy. So, you know, over the years that I've been involved in energy policy, one of them is, is nuclear versus uh, renewables. Uh, I think the, probably the, the big one at the moment is uh, electrification of heat versus uh, hydrogen. And one of, the, one of the other debates that comes back is, do we have all the technology, um, do we have all the technology we need to meet um, uh, net zero? And on one side, you'll have people saying, oh, we've got absolutely uh, everything we need. It's just a case of deploying it as, as, as quickly uh, as, as possible. But as Julia said, there's also social consent. And the other side is like, no, we need massive innovation and we need to invent new technologies, uh, uh, et cetera. And you know, these, these, are, these are kind of debates that hum around in, um, in, the, in the energy space. And I'm gonna just talk a bit about how we see them at the energy uh, systems catapult. So lot, lots of people when they're talking about innovation, they think it's kind of, you know, absolutely wacky uh, new ideas that, 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 that uh, have to be uh, invented. So um, one that's kicking around at the moment is uh, uh, kind of a solar beam down from, uh, down from space into a power station. Again, could be really exciting. Um, you've got, you know, ideas like nuclear fusion, um, which had a big breakthrough uh, recently. But I don't think anyone, even Ian and the brilliant team at, uh, uh, at, at, at Cullum, would would say that that's going to be on the on the grid uh, any time soon. And if you work at an innovation agency like the Energy Systems Catapult, like I do your days are filled with these, you know, people coming up with um, fantastic, uh, wonderful new technologies, but that's kind of innovation. Uh, sorry, that's invention, really. The, the innovation is, is much more prosaic. It is about often joining up com different combinations of technology, you know, the classic uh, case, uh, you know, one of the classic examples of brilliant innovation is, well, let's join up this amazing technology called the wheel with this amazing technology called the suitcase, something that was resisted for years by the suitcase industry. And, uh, and now we all uh, rattle around with, uh, with wheelie uh, suitcases, as it were. And the energy industry is no different. And you've seen some brilliant examples from Jonathan uh, uh, and, uh, and from Julia on, um, on, on, you know, what technology, what kind of fantastic combinations could be could be uh, could be put up so do we have the all the technologies we need after i've said what a tedious debate that is let me set that up as a as a, as a, as a question well in a kind of modeling sense yes so i can build you and you know we build plenty of uh, scenarios out to 2050 which says you know here is a net zero pathway for the UK economy. It's got, you know, 25 gigawatts of uh, nuclear. It's got 75 gigawatts of offshore wind or, or whatever, et cetera. So, so, and it's based on assumptions about what we know about um, te technologies. But, but in a real sense, no, we don't have all the technologies. We don't have them at the... Uh, 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 at the at, at, at the the price and the convenience that we that we need, you know, if you want to decarbonize your home heating system, it's not necessarily that straightforward right now. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, and if we did have all the technologies and we didn't need any more innovation, then well, climate change solved. Thanks very much. Let's worry about another uh, problem. So, so in a real sense, no, and that's often because. In the debate, we we really underestimate how big the transition is. And Jonathan touched on some of the kind of enormous numbers here. You know, you're talking about a at least doubling of the power system in all sorts of different scenarios over uh, over the next uh, thirty years. You're talking about the creation of a low carbon hydrogen system, which you know our entire hydrogen demand in the UK is about 27 terawatt hours a year at the moment. It's likely to get up to 200, 250 of low carbon hydrogen by 2050. That's a whole new 
energy system, the size of the electricity system, which, you know, is likely that we're going to need to create, Mi you know, how 20 million homes need to be switched to low carbon heating systems, electric vehicles, uh, etc. And there are some things which even, you know, the, the model is even though mostly kind of ambitious assumptions can't see uh, that we um, that we are going to uh, that, that you know it's unlikely that we're going to crack aviation low carbon aviation in the time frame uh, we need you know diet's a very tricky one so you're going to have to need uh, negative emissions uh, technologies it's the kind that uh, Julia was talking about with direct air capture etc so this is enormous this is an enormous uh, transition and and whilst we always get fixated on the technologies and that's an important part of it there are the much bigger question, I think, is, is the system going to work uh, when we adjust all these all these technologies? The, the metaphor I like in terms of the size of the challenge is it's like we are rebuilding uh, an aeroplane while the thing is still flying. You know, it's so, it's that difficult. You have to you know, we can't say, right, let's shut down the power system for uh for, for 10 years where we where we low carbon it you know we have to keep it going we have to keep it we have to keep it working so um, and you know and that's quite a practical level at a low le uh, at, at a local level which is why you know I think the uh, the work up in uh, uh, Norfolk and Suffolk is so uh, exciting because it's really trying to understand in a practical sense how that uh, transition will work how it actually work because what happens if suddenly everyone on the street you know gets gets an EV at the same time and everyone gets a heat pump at the same time is the low voltage network actually going to be able to cope with that what are we going to expect in terms of consumers providing flexibility to the system how will this all fit together um, you know those are the big challenges so you know what's trying to set up what what might be the kind of debate that um, that 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 so, so so what needs to happen you know, and we can get into this debate afterwards. So first of all, you've got to get the market design um, right. You know, the, the, the incentives for decarbonisation in the UK economy are a total mess, chaotic in, indeed. And guess what? The areas where we have good incentives for decarbonising, power, uh, waste, uh, et cetera, are the areas where we've made the biggest progress. Where we've got, where, we're, where our incentives are so bad that we're effectively, effectively subsidising pollution, heating, domestic heating, et cetera, for all sorts of sensible political reasons, uh, we, we, um, we need to get those, we need to get the set of carbon incentives right. But that's not enough. We also need to get our market signals right to encourage different types of technology offerings for, to provide the flexibility of a, you know, likely very heavy renewables uh, system going forward. We need to get that to work as well. So that's about getting price signals much more granular um, so that understand, you know, both locationally, so that uh, we understand that if there's a kind of constraint locally that that's being fixed locally and the signals and, and price incentives to do that. Um, but also, you know, it's going to have to be a much more um, dynamic system. So getting the market design and the, and the carbon incentives right is absolutely essential for encouraging uh, new in, uh, innovation and, and companies to come in. Second point is we've got to think really hard about the integration of uh, technologies. And that's something that came through in both the both presentations. You know, how is this actually all going to fit together? Because we are moving from a system where you've got kind of 400, couple of hundred players in the uh, in the electricity system, largely, you know, big centralized power stations and a kind of relatively unresponsive load to one way you're going to have millions of actors, uh, whether that's through EVs or through um, uh, heat pumps, uh, etc. And that can't all be controlled by, you know, a brilliant bloke or a woman in the National Grid uh, Control Center. Um, it's uh, uh, unless they had, you know, uh, 15,000 arms and uh, a, a brilliant brain. It's going to be digitalized. It's going to be much more um, uh, 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 flexible and uh, it's going to be much more, much more, much more local. But that integration also has to happen at a local level. We spend so much time thinking about the national UK system. How is that actually going to work in Norfolk? You have to understand the heating system, the buildings, um, all of those kind of questions really locally to to work it through. And 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 the and the project that Julia talks about is just just a really exciting example of how that's doing. But at the moment, it's all a bit ad hoc, we don't really have systems for, for working out how uh, local planning, energy planning is going to going to take place. Yes, we're going to have to make some big, uh, big, uh, big bets 
in terms of uh, innovation. Again, there's always a sense that innovation happens in, you know, it's kind of comes from the tech sector. Innovation happens in people's sheds. So, you know, it's kind of Steve Jobs invented Apple in his, his mum's garage or, or, or whatever it is. Um, the, you don't, you know, the truth is you don't come up with a 10 megawatt uh, offshore wind turbine in your shed, or at least you've got to have a, a pretty enormous shed. You know, you need scale, you need to be able repeatable uh, delivery. And of course, that's been the success of the, uh, offshore wind industry um, uh, and, you know, is the kind of approach that the nuclear industry really should have, but I, I still don't think government's in the right place. For that. And the final area of innovation, which I think is so important, if thing that needs to happen, and we probably don't, we tend to think about innovation in tech terms, but the other area of innovation is what the consumer wants. You know, we've had the first wave of decarbonisation in the UK has been pretty simple for a consumer point of view. I come home, turn the light on and you know, 99.9999% of the time it comes on when I want it. Um, and I don't really care whether it's coming from a coal fire power station or an offshore wind turbine or a nuclear power station or whatever, whatever it is. Um, but heating EVs, that is different. And that is going to require different type of innovation, innovation in uh, propositions to consumers, into the services they have. It's a really exciting area. It doesn't get anywhere near enough attention, but it's going to be absolutely essential if we're going to have the public buy-in uh, to uh, to this enormous transition that we're going through. I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks Guy, that was really informative. Do you have any good examples of taking innovation from other industries outside of energy to help forward the net zero agenda? Um, I, I, I think the one that resonates the most with uh, me and with the colleagues we work with is 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 mobile telephony in many ways, you know, mobile mobile phones. If in many ways, um, what we're seeing with um, uh, what we're seeing with new uh, with the energy system is is about to become digitalized in the same way that that happened with mobile telephony. And so uh, we need to think about how we avoid new monopolies, how we create systems where you're you know, your EV is talking easily to your, um, you know, your kind of therm smart thermostat, which is talking to the system, et cetera. Um, and that's, that is about lots of test environments, lots of kind of digital enablement technology and, and a very kind of uh, unsexy but important word, which is interoperability, which is one that I'm always banging on about. So, so that, that's one of the big challenges coming forward from the, from the sector. And that unleashes huge innovation, you know, um, once you get the infrastructure right, you, you you create the environment where smartphones and things, things that we, you know, I remember somebody described a smartphone for me and uh, some, I was like, well, that sounds a bit pointless. Why would I need that? And now, you know, frankly, this talk is the longest that I've gone without touching my smartphone uh, uh, in the last 48 hours. So uh, I better get back to it. Great. Thank you, Guy. So before we move on to the Q&A part of the session, I want to take a quick moment to highlight to everyone on this call about how they can get involved in the various networks that are hosting tonight's event. So on the next slide, um, the email addresses are on screen and you can find out more on the various social media pages. We're always eager to welcome new members or to listen to any ideas you have. Um, if we go to the next slide, hopefully you're all feeling suitably inspired by tonight's speakers to join us in our latest campaign to ensure nuclear is part of the discussions at COP26 in Glasgow later this year. The Net Zero Needs Nuclear campaign aims to promote nuclear as a low carbon energy source, drive support for nuclear as a crucial element of transitioning to net zero by 2050, and to influence policymakers in advance of COP26 to be carefully considering the role nuclear should play in clean energy discussions. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in being a part of, then the details are on screen, so please visit netzeroneedsnuclear.com to see our position paper, calls to action, and so much more. And for my final plug this evening, ahead of the Q&As, it's for our next event in our COP26 series, which is focused on the green recovery and will be on Thursday the 5th of August. So make sure to sign up for that when you can. I believe the link is being posted in the chat. But on to the Q&As. So let's see what we've got in the chat, shall we? Uh, so we've got a question about innovation here. Um, Guy, if you want to start off on this one. So in terms of innovating in our relationships between nuclear and renewables, 
What are the steps we need to take now and how will that ease the path to net zero? Um, so, uh, so that's a huge question. Um, we, we don't need to try and force these texts together, right? We've got to think about it from a system. What do we want the system outcomes to be in the in the future? You know, we want a low carbon uh, power system. We want it to be as reliable as as the system that we've got, and we want it to be as cost effective uh, as possible. And that's the point that I would say is is most essential. Is you've got to get the market frameworks in in place, which allow, which are going to allow you to reveal what is the right combination between, you know, some of the brilliant storage technologies Jonathan was talking about, between hydrogen innovation, the that, you know, all of these kind of things. And instead, frankly, of what we've got at the moment, which is government, uh, you know, making a huge number of choices in the in the in the market, or or in, in some cases failing to make any choices uh, about about technology. And it just needs to, you know, it it, 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 if you get that market framework right, that's the most important thing. And then, you know, I know there was a kind of suggestion earlier that we shouldn't have competition between technologies. I quite like competition between technologies because it kind of reveals who's who's going to be uh, who's going to be the best one. But um, uh, but it might lead to amazing partnerships. That's you know of the kind of projects you that Julia uh, talked about, which are, which is really exciting as well. But it should be driven by the market, not by Whitehall, is my view. Great, thank you very much. And um, possibly one for you, Julia, but welcome other people's input. What are the biggest challenges for changing public perception of nuclear? Um, I think that the uh, a program of building nuclear power stations in which they are seen as being part of the new, more flexible energy system will in itself change the public perception of nuclear. The, 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 the public opinion of nuclear, we do a lot of polling as you'd imagine, is actually perfectly reasonably positive. It's most positive in the places where nuclear power stations are, because people are used to living with them and they provide an awful lot of high quality, well paid employment. But it's actually perfectly stable and popular across the country. And even incidents, I, mean, I say incidents, but you know, think, things like when things like the Fukushima, uh, sorry, the Chernobyl series was on the TV, it, it, sort of goes down a little dip for maybe for a couple of weeks for the duration of the series but then it just pings back up to where it was before it's pretty stable at sort of a third enthusiastic a third um not keen and a third indifferent and uh, to be honest not many people spend that much time thinking about sources of electricity generation so i think the there's a different view in the commentariat to the view in the public in the public it's broadly popular and certainly in the idea of building new nuclear and particularly um, the more um, the more British jobs, UK content, et cetera, there is in the new build programme. It's, it's actively popular in particularly in conservative seats and actually particularly in, in what were red wall seats. That's great. Guy and Jonathan, do you have any other thoughts to add on how do we change public perception of nuclear? Yeah, I'd agree with Julia. I don't think it's, I think, you know, I don't want to be complacent about it, but I don't think it's too bad in uh, the UK. And that's, that's a great, um, that's, that's a, that's a great, that's a great strength, uh, et cetera. I mean, you know, the most important challenge for nuclear industry in terms of public perception is that, that one, it's delivering, you know, great jobs and, um, you know, interesting and exciting work uh, for people, particularly in areas that, that don't, uh, that that may have higher uh, unemployment as well, but also that challenge of you know how does it get its costs down? How does it have the innovation, etc., to uh, to become you know more and more more and more uh, important in the system? And every time it can prove that it's it's serious about that and moving forward, then it makes you know it makes it more valuable to the system as well as to the kind of political economy of it. Certainly, totally, certainly totally add to that. Absolutely, I agree with what Julia and Guy have just said there. I think the other thing is is just constant education, but you know, telling the story because I think you know events like this, the the, the story that you 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 we've heard from 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 all the speakers. I think we need to tell that story much more and much stronger about the role of nuclear and the integration. I want to also a plug for the BBC series that's on at the moment. So if you haven't seen it, absolutely go onto iPlayer and watch it. It's the building of Hinkley Point C. Uh, I think it's only the first episode has been shared, uh, sort of show so far, but it's it's on iPlayer. It's a four part series, absolutely brilliant, and certainly give you a really good uh, insight into some of the 
real opportunities for, for careers, for, for business, and that perhaps people don't typically associate with building a nuclear power station, certainly around you know, civil engineering, certainly the, the, the opportunities around catering and hospitality uh, were absolutely incredible. And I think it's, it's you know, waking a lot of people up to, it's not just about nuclear engineering jobs, my word, there's so much more to, to, to building and operating a nuclear power station. So I think constant education for me, just to add to, to what Julia and I say. Yeah, I think you're right. That that Hinkley uh, documentary is a fascinating watch. Definitely worth checking out. Um, so next question is, how do you ensure the electricity system remains secure whilst making the seismic transition to net zero? Anyone want to take that one on? Well, luckily that's a job for the national grid, but um, it's a job that they do very well and they will I think the question isn't really, will we have secure supplies of electricity? I'm sure we will. I think the question is, um, how far will we have to rely on gas while some of the nuclear goes off and until more of the nuclear comes back on? And with our, um, with our changing politics, how far is the UK going to be willing to rely on interconnected electricity? I think those are both questions, but I think that, that's, that's about the carbon content of electricity really, rather than is the national grid going to get the light, let the lights go off out? I'm quite sure it isn't. I'll just just add to that, I think it comes back to the point I've raised about you need, you know, intelligent network design and genuine network architecture, not just in terms of what's the network we, we need, that you know, we need for the UK and beyond, but also what have we actually got? And then we can plan the transition route carefully. And there will not be one, you know, one size fits all for this. You know, local grids, local opportunities, as well as looking at the transmission and the distribution grid separately are going to be really important to look at here. But I think the, the transition and understanding that transition route from what we've got to what we need is going to be absolutely critical. I'm not quite sure we know what that network architectural design looks like yet in terms of what we need by, by 2030, 2040, or even 2050. And the guy's shaking his head. But uh, I think one of the key things, it's an interesting stat, which could have been buried in some of the, the, the recent roadmaps, but the NIA, so the Nuclear Industry Association, recently came out with its hydrogen roadmap, suggesting that we actually need around about 12 or 13 gigawatts of dedicated nuclear output just to supply some of the, you know, the, the opportunity or the, the 75 terawatt hours of green hydrogen, uh, which is only about a third of the production in one of the higher scenarios for hydrogen output. So if we want to develop hydrogen and create green hydrogen, we need a lot more nuclear that will be dedicated to electrolyzers. But that just gives you an indication of the scale of the change that we need to see if we're going to switch out from gas to hydrogen or other opportunities. But um, yeah, we need to plan the transition, but we need to have a really clear idea of what we're moving to in terms of that network design. So, so agreeing strongly with Jonathan that we don't yet have the architecture on um, uh, 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 from, a, from a kind of market uh, and regulatory perspective that we need going forward. And I'm probably a bit more nervous um, about security of supply uh, uh, than, than, than others in this debate, but actually at a, at a local level, not necessarily at a national level. I think, you know, the action is at the, at the, the kind of low voltage uh, end of the, uh, of, the, of, of the system because you're going to have, you know, households and businesses with much higher electricity load, you know, with electrified heating, with EVs, uh, etc. And the truth is, we don't. We bought. We built. We built quite a lot of kind of spare capacity into the local uh, system. But it's not like we've got good metrics and measurements about how close we are uh, getting to the to the because we never had to worry about it, right? You know, household behaviour, consumer behaviour has been relatively predictable. That is all about to shift um, uh, potentially. So again, you know, we are missing this bit of infrastructure. Or, or, or sorry, governance architecture in the, in the jargon around the local, around you know who's really thinking about how you're going to make sure this all works together at the local level. Which again, which is why some of the projects being talked about here are so exciting. Great. So I think we probably have time for one last question. So do you think the pace of change in the energy industry and government is fast enough to achieve net zero goals and tackle climate change? Nowhere near. Guys, you can 
Probably the shortest answer is, is absolutely no. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, I, I was in government inside for, for, for three years and you know, it's, uh, you know, you look, you look at the, the numbers you're talking about, the sum of assumptions that sit behind the, carbon, the sixth carbon budget, et cetera. And you compare that to the pace of negotiations that, <laughs> that Julia's fighting for, <laughs> you know, and that's, and that's, you know, before you get into heating questions, except CCS, you know, we haven't touched about that to, to, today particularly, you know, these are in, this is enormous. And we are, I mean, we're going fast and it's incredible the progress we've made, but we are, we, we have really got to step up over the, um, over the next 10 years. And all I would say, the companies we, we work with, small, large, they are so up for this challenge. They're so excited about it. You know, the engineering, the business model innovation, they are, you know, it's a really want to take, you know, take advantage of it, which is, is, is what we kind of help, but they really need government to get the signals in place, uh, et cetera, which of course comes down to politics and social acceptance, all that, I understand it, um, but, uh, but yeah, we know we're near. I'd only comment that I never knew I had such reserves of patience until I got into the nuclear development game. <laughs> I'm pretty much becoming a Buddhist. Oh. I think on I that. Follow, note, I can't follow that comment at all. So I'll take that to There we go. So I'm sure we can all agree that tonight has been a fascinating look into the role of nuclear, renewables, and new technologies. Good play to help achieve a net zero future. I'd like to thank our three panelists, Jonathan, Julia, and Guy, for taking the time to come and talk to us this evening. It's been really great having you all. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. <laughs>